Metal. Become enlightened, have fun, and tell all your friends and family to share with everyone they know. You can find us on Facebook and stay up to date on our Facebook group, or find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Our podcast can be found on Libsyn, iHeart, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. Most of all, remember to go to our official website at ConsciousRadioNetwork.com for podcasts, posts, future shows, and scheduling. We also want to welcome our international audience. Don't stop now and join the community. Subscribe today. Conscious Radio Network. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you might be on this spaceship we call Earth. Welcome to Conscious Radio Network's weekly podcast series, The Weekly Seance. I'm your host, Reverend Dr. Paul Meckis. If this is your first time tuning in, please click subscribe, like, follow, share, comment, whatever it is that you do. And also, follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Today, a lifetime of UFO and ET contact research and investigation. Our guest today has spent most of her life seeking answers to perplexing nature of extraterrestrial contact through investigation, social, social research, and experimentation. She is widely considered one of the leading UFO contact researchers of our time. She has worked on three comprehensive studies on nearly 5,000 experiencers and has six professionally published books. In, 2000, in 2021, the UFO, the International UFO Congress, honored her with its Lifetime Achievement Award. You may have seen her on Ancient Aliens or any number of television programs on history, travel, science, and Fox network channels or several well, documentary movies let's welcome to the show and in the studio for the first time kathleen martin yes, welcome kathleen how are you doing i'm doing very well thank you and it's an honor to it's an honor we're almost neighbors we i didn't realize how close <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is awesome and we we met quite actually we were introduced um, by a, a, um, a mutual friend of ours uh, quite a few years ago, and that's how uh, that's how we originally met. Um, God rest his soul. He's up there probably watching us right now. Going, go on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Kathleen, how how did this all start for you? Well, I was thirteen years old, and my aunt and uncle took a trip, just a short trip for a few days uh, to Niagara Falls and then up through Toronto, through Ontario, spent the night in Ontario. That was the second night. And then spent the following afternoon just as tourists in Montreal. They had thought they might spend the night in Montreal, but then my uncle decided to drive home. He was well rested from the night before. And so they headed toward New Hampshire, thinking that they would simply stop for the night if they grew tired. But they didn't. And they were driving through upstate New Hampshire when my aunt spotted a new light in the sky. Now, she wondered if it might be a meteorite at first, but then she realized that it didn't act like a meteorite. It moved upward in the sky. And this attracted her attention, and she continued to watch it as it came in closer and closer and closer until finally it swooped down and stopped above the highway just to the right of their vehicle. Barney had to stop the car in the middle of the road so he wouldn't be directly underneath it. And it, now it was only about 200 feet above them. Wow. He grabbed his binoculars, got out of the car. He's looking up at this craft. He steps away from the door to get a better view. He'd left the door open. The car was running. And when he did, the craft shifted to an adjacent field. And he followed it toward that field. Looking through the binoculars, he did not believe that he could be observing what he was seeing. 
He pulled the binoculars away from his eyes, shook his head, and it was still there. And he uh, now could see that the craft had descended to within about 100 feet Mm. from the ground and about 50 feet away. And he's looking up at it, and he sees uh, figures looking back at him. They were dressed in black, shiny uniforms. And all of a sudden, all of them, except for one, stepped away from the windows and went to what appeared to be some kind of a panel. The one at the window is looking down at Barney, and Barney is growing terrified. As he's watching, little red lights start to slide out from the sides of the craft on fin-like structures, and something starts to drop down from underneath the craft. Barney doesn't know what it was, but I know what it was because I actually have a photograph of one of these. It is a carrier beam of sorts that the ETs use to pick people up. So Barney was right when he was fearful that he was going to be captured. He said, like a bug in a net, close quote. (laughs) And so he pulled the binoculars from his eyes so forcefully that he broke the strap. He ran back to the car, screaming to Betty that they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured. He went speeding down the highway because as he was entering the car, he noticed the craft was coming in his direction. And within a short period of time, he and Betty heard a series of code-like buzzing sounds striking the trunk of the car, Mm. where those shiny spots were the following day, following morning. And the car vibrated, and they felt a tingling sensation pass through their bodies. In fact, Betty felt the metal on the car to see if she'd get an electric shock from it. She did not, but they felt this electrical tingling sensation. The next thing they knew, they were 35 miles down the highway. Mm. There was a second series of buzzing sounds. They didn't see the craft this time, but it returned them to full consciousness. They had memories of finding themselves in another spot. They were on a dirt road. And there were tall trees all around. There was a roadblock, figures standing in the highway. And there was a fiery orb that appeared to be sitting on the ground. For years, they looked for that spot. They went back time and time again. And finally, they found it in 1965. Hmm. So when they arrived home, they uh, found that Things were not as they should have been. Uh, Betty's dress was torn in several places, the top of the zipper. The hem was torn down. The dress was torn from waist to hemline. My uncle's best dress shoes were so deeply scraped that he had to buy new shoes. The watches that they were wearing never ran again. Uh, So many mysteries that they uh, simply could not answer. Betty was a curious person. She immediately, well, within a couple of days, went to the Portsmouth Public Library and took out the first book she'd ever read on the topic. There was an address inside. If you've had a UFO sighting, report it to the National Investigations Committee Hmm. on Aerial Phenomena. And that's what she did. Yeah. Wow. And now and you were 13 years old when when they told this to you at their experiences absolutely it was within a couple of days of the time that she made that phone call to my mother which was the day they arrived home wow that we were at their house and i witnessed i actually saw some of this evidence and i heard betty's story from her own lips yeah how long was it uh, um after this incident um did they did they immediately go to the authorities and report it or did they they wait a little while going, whoa, what happened? <laughs> well, when my m- mother was on the phone with Betty that evening, my father's best friend, who was the chief of police in Newton, New Hampshire, the little town next to Kingston where I grew up, um, said, Pease Air Force Base wants people who see UFOs to call and file a report. Hmm. So Betty and Barney, being the good citizens that they were, filed the report. And... Uh, So they did do that. Then uh, 
Miss Betty read that book and they filed a report with NICAP. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's um it and this is uh this was in sixty what was it? That was nineteen sixty one. Nineteen sixty one. Wow. Now um you've you've uh got six books out. I do. And um I wanna show those. Um so you can go let me bring up uh do I have it saved here? I think I do. Yes, it is. Look at that. Wow, cool. Something works today. Technology. <laughs> um so everybody can go to your website which is uh www.kathleen-martin.com and you can actually go to where is he? can I bring that up will it work will it work yes it is haha <laughs> so any are these in, these are in order of um of publication no they're not in order of publication uh the first was captured but it's in the third place there because I updated it in uh, 2021, and uh, so it's fairly new. <laughs> oh, okay. And, uh, actually, that was the first book, and then came uh, Science Was Wrong, then Capture, no, no then The Alien Abduction Files, mm. then Back Fiction and Flying Saucers, then Extraterrestrial Contact, and last, Forbidden Knowledge. But it's not going to be my last book. I uh, yeah yeah it it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like chocolate you can't just have one right. <laughs> <laughs> and it must be an honor too to have uh, uh worked with uh late Stanton Friedman um God rest his soul um it's uh, and yeah and you've got three of them actually the three was it yes, the three yeah the three of them three of those books together yes yeah and these are the uh it the was bottom, wonderful working with him. Yeah, the bottom three here. And um yeah, wow. But yeah, you can go to the website that uh Kathleen slash let me go back to the page here. Anyone? There we go. Yeah, just go to the website. It's also gonna be down in the uh the description of the video as well. All the information you can find find her books. And they can find the they can they can buy them on the website or they can go to Amazon or you can purchase autographed copies on my website. You can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and the books are available in uh, all sorts of formats. Cool. Cool. Um now being so close to um the the central Florida area, I want to know I've been asking around. I think I may have dropped the, dropped this on a couple episodes, maybe one or two in some of my past shows. But I'd say in the recent past, in the 1980s, there was a massive UFO sighting in Winter Garden. It started in Winter Garden, Florida, and moved its way into Claremont. And they said it lit up the night sky like a football field. But there is nobody who can who can talk about it because they didn't experience it we got so many new people here in the area mm -hmm. so that might be a case that you may want to work on that or start asking around i've never heard of that one. yeah it's like it, it started and someone saw it um in the skies starting in like the okoe winter garden area and then it made its way into the claremont area and it just lit up the night sky and it's it's i I don't know. I, I'd like to get some. So if anybody is out there and know anything about this, please, please come forward. Talk to us. We want to know more. <laughs> um, so or call MUFON. Uh, submit your submit your um, your information and stuff like that. So. Um, so. Um, is there is do you have a new book coming out? Do you any working on anything recent? We are working on a survey. And the results of the survey will uh, become a new book. I'm working with Dr. Melanie Barton, and uh, it is a survey on religious belief and extraterrestrial life. Mm -hmm. So anyone can fill it out. We, we want members of the general public yeah. to complete that survey. But we also have people who are experiencers of contact. Yeah, yeah. Um. Now, through through the uh, I, I've known a, a couple people who just don't know, 
they feel like they have experienced or think they may be an experiencer, whether dreams that they have or missing time, what would be some of the clues that some of our listeners or viewers out there can look for um, that might be triggers to or um, ways to might be signs that they've had an experience, but <laughs> they really consciously don't know or remember? What I would recommend first is that you buy the book, Extraterrestrial Contact, What to Do When You've Been Abducted, because that book is full of information of that kind. So uh, it's going to tell you how to investigate your case, how to determine uh, whether or not you're an experiencer, the stages that experiencers go through, uh, how to know if it's actually ET contact or if it's something else paranormal, um, on and on and on. Yeah. But some of the signs are you have vague memories of having had contact. Most people have some conscious recall of mm. this. It might be a close encounter with a craft. If a craft has been uh, within 500 feet of you, you've, there's a good chance you were taken. Mm. If you have someone in your family who is uh, a contactee or an abductee, you might have been taken. It, it tends to be intergenerational in nature. Check your body out. If you have one of these experiences, maybe you've uh, woken during the night, there's been a light in your room, um, you, and all of a sudden you lose consciousness, when you wake up again, check your body. Yeah. And if you have any unusual patterned marks, photograph them. If you have a UV light, go into a dark room and check your body for fluorescence. If you do find fluorescence on your body, you want to photograph it without uh, a flash. You want to do all of those things because if you're going to make a MUFON report uh, for an investigation, you want to show the evidence that you have that's extraordinarily important. It's a lot more significant than if you just have a vague memory that something might have happened to you. Yeah, try to be, try to be as, as concise and precise as possible. When you when you put in a report, I I I did one um, a couple months ago. Maybe it's more than that, or less than that. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing time. It seems it seems like a long time ago, but it, it's very recent. Um, and it, it was actually right over this house. Is that so? Yeah. And I was looking. I was I was looking at an app that shows FAA registered aircraft mm -hmm. in the sky, and. Me and my girlfriend went outside, and I just wanted to show her how concise and precise it was. I'm like, yeah, look, there's an airplane. Up, oh, there's another airplane. Up, oh, there's another one. And she goes, hey, there's another one. And it, we're looking at it. I'm going, that's not an airplane. It was phasing in and out of – it had no lights. Mm -hmm. It was phasing in and out of visual perception as though, like, it was clear – um, and the light that it was giving off was just a reflection of the light from the ground mm -hmm. and made no sound. Sounds familiar. <laughs> right? So how close was it? <laughs> it looked, because there was no reference in the sky uh, and, it, and it being dark, it looked like it was a um, three, four hundred feet, possibly. Mm -hmm. Close encounter then. Yeah. Yeah. And then it just disappeared. Gone. So maybe you're an experiencer, but you don't know it. <laughs> or maybe you do know it. I don't know. I'm looking for implants. <laughs> <laughs> now, has anybody come forward with um, with somebody with implants? or have? And the second part of that question is, have they found implants? Have they have uh, evidence of implants? Absolutely. Well, you know, Dr. Roger Lear, the late Dr. Roger Lear, was the implant removal doctor. He oh, yeah. Writers, yeah. Uh, and he uh, did remove, um, I think it was 15 implants wow. with a surgical team. 
And they went to a laboratory. Some of them were only shards of glass. But there were some that had remarkable properties. First, they were connected to proprioceptive nerves Mm. in the body. They seemed to have intelligence. When they were removed, they actually ran away from the scalpel. Whoa. They did not want to be taken out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, one of them actually transmitted into deep space for a period of about 30 days before it shut off. Huh. Uh, just uh, the body does not reject them. They're co- uh, recovered with a uh, kind of a very tough, a kind of organic material. Uh, so uh, they're very, very interesting. To I wish I had the answers, uh, but I, I don't. I do suspect that uh, instead of being tracking devices, that they are communications mm-hmm. devices, and also that they monitor the health of the human body, because in... Uh, our MUFON study of 516 experiencers, uh, we were able to identify those who ha- actually had UFO abduction syndrome. They were confirmed abductees. And 45% said they had been healed. Yeah. Now, some people, there might be some people out there that might be afraid to come forward. And because, uh, you know, I'm going to be humiliated or, or whatnot. And um, what what would you have to say to to these people that are, are afraid to tell their story? I give them a little bit of hope. What I would say is go to the Mutual UFO Network website and get in touch with the ERT, the Experiencer Resource Team. They're not going to judge you. I set that team up. I founded that team in 2012. And that team is non judgmental. They're going to be supportive. You can speak to them. Don't worry if you cry, if you break down. They're not interrogators. They yeah. are people who are there to assist you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you see the future of um, all of this? the uh, future of MUFON, the future of of your research, the future of, um, I might get a, I'm going to ask this question, and I, I doubt YouTube's going to shut me down because everybody's talking about it. Um, what are your thoughts on this Project Bluebeam that has been coming, is, is coming out, it, it seems to be more popular, more popular that, um, that the government seem, that we, Okay, it is a conspiracy, I guess. A theory, conspiracy <laughs> theory. Um, but whether there's proof of it or not. Have you heard of Project Boobing? Uh Vaguely, but, you know, I don't follow anything conspiracy theory. <laughs> I, I am interested I'm looking in for the, the facts. government scientists who are <laughs> yeah. actually doing the real <laughs> research. I'm excited that our government is actually funding um research on this mm-hmm. and investigating uh, the military cases. You know, I've worked with military officers who have been taken. Mm. I know military officers who have been taken. Yeah. And the government is finally uh, making a little bit public uh, about the presence of these craft. They're not uh, coming forward and saying people are being taken, but the Navy, for example, has released the video on the Tic Tac yeah, video the, yeah. and the video off the East Coast from North Carolina down to St. Augustine or Jacksonville in that area. So there they have acknowledged that these things were seen in the sky and the people who saw them who were uh, scientists, who were experienced military uh, engineers talk about how these craft uh, have been recorded on radar and can outfly or outmaneuver anything that we have on this planet. They can hover for hours at a time stationary at uh, 12,000 feet up 
are 20,000 feet up, they can in a second drop to 50 feet above the ocean. Mm. Uh, they can uh, bounce back and forth over one just like it that's the size of an aircraft carrier under the water. Wow. Uh, seemingly communicating with that. Uh, there is a swirl in the water underneath it, and then it can rise vertically just as quickly. It can travel just as easily under the water as it can in the, our atmosphere and in space. That's not us, folks. Yeah, yeah. And it is <clears throat> with the disclosure projects that are coming out with, um, with Dr. Stephen Greer that, um, you know, he's heading that movement. And um, there was something just recently about that in, D in D.C. that I saw that he was doing. And um, and uh, and all your, you and all your colleagues. Is there um, now? Um, I'm not sure when he had passed, but the, um, Dr. Alan Hynek, the work that he did with, uh, I think, what was it with the military and stuff like yes, that? that was with Project Blue Book. Yeah, Project Blue Book. Mm -hmm. um, but your thoughts. Let me go, you know, step away from the conspiracy theory and, 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 and work into my original question was the future. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see the future of, of this technology, of our research, of that day of, I wouldn't say first contact. There is no first contact. We've been contacted along. They've been here for a very long time. It's just now. Do you see that there's going to be that day and it's coming shortly that we're going to realize? I hope so, but the government isn't going to tell us. Now, they have a, a sort of a, a self-interest in this technology. They have been collecting down crash technology for, since 1947, mm. and they have been uh, giving it to private industry to try to back engineer. Now, private industry has suppressed it. That has come out recently. Yeah. And they've suppressed it because they want to control it. They want to profit from it. So uh, that's still a problem and will continue to be a problem, I suspect. Uh, you know, you don't want China to get there first. Oh, no. <laughs> you, you want us to get there first. Yeah, it seems so, like all the all new technology always, to see, always seems to want to be used as a weapon or weaponizing, you know, with the establishments out there. It's like, come on, it, let's, make, let's make good of this technology. Some exciting news for me. I don't know if your listeners are interested in this or not, but uh, Dr. Gary Nolan, who is one of the leading uh, biologists in the world, mm -hmm. microbiologists in the world, is uh, was hired by the CIA, given funding, to study the brains of people who had Havana syndrome. And then this went into studying the brains of uh, military people who had come too close to craft and had been killed. Mm -hmm. And also then from there, it went on to studying the brains of military people who, because uh, you couldn't <laughs> remove them, yeah. uh, of the military people who had had close exposure of been on these ET craft. And what he discovered is what he thought at first was brain damage. Yeah. But then it, it discovered it was not brain damage. It's in the caudate putamen part of the brain. And what he discovered is that it is a network of neural connections, and it makes changes in these human beings. Huh. The changes are that they become more intelligent, they have more spatial awareness, and they become psychic. Ooh. So that is very exciting to me. Yeah. That, that now also begs the question, the experiencers... Um, in the cases that you have worked with, have have most of these experiencers um, exhibited that where they notice that their cognitive abilities are heightened? 
and those were questions that we put on our surveys mm. the studies that we did and yes the majority of experiencers of et contact uh, are either psychic or intuitive they become empaths they uh, become highly spiritual they uh, can communicate telepathically with these e ETs. Yeah. They, um, their attitude changes. They become very concerned about our environment, about nuclear weapons, about warfare, and they become less interested in material gain, less interested in the sorts of things that mainstream America is interested in yeah. and more interested in the preservation and care of humanity and all life on this planet. Yeah. My thoughts have always been that, um, um, you know, the extraterrestrials of, of uh, different cultures out there are making themselves more known now because we're at that level of evolution spiritual evolution and planetary evolution that we all have the gift um of insight of of, of mediumship of of being able to um, everything um and it's it's kind of like there is i'm sure you'll probably share this, this the the same thought um or the same theory that they're here to assist us that's what they're they here say. they're here to help us but it seems like there's other establishments out there that, that are trying to put that fear into into us, you know, trying to convince us that they're the enemy. Unfortunately, that is true. And I took part in an experiment for a period of two years and then uh, less often for another two or three years where uh, several of us met once a month. Mm -hmm with a group of ETs, uh, with a man who said that he was meeting with them and can communicate with them. Uh, we said, first of all, we want evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And we acquired evidence that they were there, they were real. We could feel a strong tingling sensation in our bodies. I think just like my aunt and uncle felt, yep. we learned to communicate with them telepathically. They showed us craft, they showed us orbs, and they answered our questions. And they said they have been here for a very long time. In fact, they planted our seed here. Mm. They come back from time to time to assist in our development. When we started detonating nuclear weapons, uh, the red light started flashing. And they came and they remained with us. Yeah, we got their attention. Yes, and they have been trying to educate us. They have been attempting to uh, change our human behavior so that we become more benevolent creatures. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I concur. <laughs> <laughs> um. What's coming up? Any new, uh, I asked this before, but the, now this is going to be in a different level other than a new book. What's, what's in the future? What, what is coming up? Are there new, um, um, new programs, new, new things about MUFON, new things, uh, um, new, new groups people can, can, um, join, um, um, conferences that are coming up that people might be able to, uh, go check out. Well, first, something new I want to mention is go to my website, Kathleen-Marden.com, and please complete that survey that I spoke about. Uh, next, you can go, you can look on my menu, and you can see where I'm going to be speaking this year. There are several conferences listed, and I will be at the M Mutual UFO Networks Conference in Northern Kentucky, right across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio. It's in Covington, Kentucky. It's going to be a great conference. Uh, I'm going to be hosting uh, a co-host 
of two sessions for experiencers, one Saturday morning, one Sunday morning. On Friday afternoon, I'm going to be on a panel for a panel discussion about experiencers as well. Uh, I will be speaking at several other conferences as well, so you can look at that. And uh, I'm trying to think of what else is coming up. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a <laughs> there lot. There's a lot on my <laughs> agenda, but uh, not uh, most of it uh, is not available for the public yet. But just yeah. keep listening, keep checking back with me, and uh, you'll see. Oh, uh, extraterrestrial contact has just been published in French two days oh, ago. Oh, so okay. For your French listeners, all right, uh, you can purchase it. Awesome, cool. Um, any up and coming um, um, documentaries? Any any next uh, any yeah next uh, um, appearances on ancient aliens? I uh, don't have anything lined up for Ancient Aliens right now. I will be on the Gaia channel, mm. and that's going to be in August. So the um, I will be flying out to Denver in August to appear on that program. Cool, 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 cool. Um, I've been asked to do uh, maybe do um, something on there. I'm like, let me look at it. Let me. I need to get some funding first. <laughs> out there with One thing at a time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I listen to his show every morning, mm -hmm. every single morning. He has so. a good show. Yeah, yeah. I gotta, I gotta get with his producer again to see if, uh, if I, uh, come in, um, on one of the shows, one of those little thirty-minute or one-hour stints and stuff like that at the beginning, and just kind of network. <laughs> For people in New York, New York State, I will be at the Pine Bush uh, conference or festival. I'm going to, I'm the keynote speaker. On Saturday night, then uh, I'll be in Roswell over the Fourth of July, cool. and in Exeter, New Hampshire, in early September. So uh, quite a okay. lot of traveling. Yeah, yeah. This this definitely keeps you busy. It does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with six books, it would keep me busy. Wow, awesome. Well, we have reached the end of our program, but there's a lot more. Yeah, people are like that's it. Come on, really? Why not an hour show? Well, we can, but there's hey. Oh, we, we could do a repeat. We, we could we could do a repeat, or she can come back and 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 talk about something specific. So again, make comments, like, share, comment. You know, if you have any questions and stuff like that, even in the live chat when this when this broadcast, if you have any questions, please do please ask them and um, comment, and it it gives us some uh, material for for further shows, and we can that it, that helps us build. Um, for another broadcast so uh, to to be continued so but again please check out kathleen's website at www.kathleen slash marden.com m-a-r-d-e-n for those who are listening uh, but can't actually watch this but again when you go to the uh, po the actual audio podcast you can all the links to uh, the youtube channel video um, is down there to actually watch it so other than that, um, do you have any big takeaways for our audience tonight? I just want to say that please, please, please understand that most of these extraterrestrials are kind and benevolent. There are scientists who are carrying out their mission to try to save humanity, and if they can't, then at least they'll have the DNA from this planet. There are some who aren't so nice, but they're keeping them in check mm. as best they can. That's what they tell us. Yeah. And that can be the next show, talking about different races of beings out there. We can have several guests on that thing. But other than that, yeah, cool. Kathleen, thank you again for being on the show tonight. Honored to, to have you on our show, and um, welcome back anytime. Um, My pleasure. Hop, skip, and a jump. <laughs> pleasure to talk with you. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here on the Weekly Seance. And until next time, we will see you on the next show.